What up, meatheads? It's Travis, American Butcher. And this, this is the Meat Block Podcast, the, the somewhat weekly podcast by butchers for everyone. In this week's episode, I am joined again by Jess Prowls, the creator and face of Hardcore Carnivore. We're going to be talking about that and new products. And she's, this is her second time being on the Meat Block. So it, we're going to, we're going to see what's new. And if you want to go back and listen to that first episode she was on, that was way back two years ago on episode 18. Yeah. Go check out episode 18. That was uh, only 18 episodes into this show. This is a completely different show back then. Wow. Anyway, without further ado, Jess Prowls. How many glasses have you had? How many what? Glasses of wine. How many classes have I taught? No, I said, how many glasses of wine have you had? Oh, how many? I say, well, you think after that response. Good cutting enhances this is the, the quality, quality of good, good meat. meat. Poor cutting results in a inferior piece of meat, regardless of quality. Hello? Hello. Could you hear me? I can. Okay. It's just like the Adele song. Yeah. <laughs> so, h- how are you, Jess? Great. I've, I've had wine, Travis. Oh. So I'm good. Okay. I haven't yet because it's like 5.30 here. And... Yeah, but it's 5.30 on a Friday, so realistically, you should have started about an hour ago. I know I should have, but... Yeah. The whole drinking and driving thing, you know. Oh, there's that. Yes, yeah. There's that. Which I'm not against. You, um, don't drink and drive. I guess I should rephrase that. <laughs> <laughs> In no way am yeah. I suggesting that. Unless you're on there's your own not. property. Um, <laughs> so so uh, if, if you're new, new to the show, listener, that'd be weird. But if you... Uh, got introduced because of Jess's social media and hearing this, this is the meat block podcast. And I recommend you go and listen to episode 18 where, uh, uh, Jess was, that was the first episode you were on. And a lot of exciting things has happened since then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, 18 and now we're on episode like, 140 something. Oh, that was crazy. I'm super excited to be back though because I feel like we've also watched each other like grow and put up with a lot of stuff on Instagram and the conversation that we had all of those episodes ago is going to be so different. Yeah. Because I feel like I know you better now too. I know. Yeah. Back then, um, yeah, we, we just, well, we we become texting friends and uh, since then. So <laughs> well, not only that. Yeah. Plus, thanks for your, your question and answer sessions on Instagram when you're particularly generous with the martinis too. Yeah, which I love. If y'all haven't seen that, which I'm sure if you're listening to this podcast, you have. But Travis does this thing where he will ask a question on Instagram stories, and like everything's in play. Mm-hmm. He'll answer it. You know, where they talk. Y'all get questions from everything from you know butcher stuff through to how do you deal with people who annoy you and and everything. And he's really frank about it, and it's really refreshing to see someone who is really honest online because most people have this weird facade. So here's a golf clap for you. Oh, thank you. Um, sure. And I guess uh, this would be a good segue to to talk about the online uh, community and, and, and what what do you see as far as obligations for, um, you know, someone who I, I don't know if you do you use the term influencer? Is that something that is that is that a term? Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then what? <laughs> What what responsibility? Because I see, I I remember when in uh, online communities were were young and in their infancy, and it seems like somehow 
you would in the beginning you would be flattered if someone reposted your thing and then it right. then it turned into like well why are these people reposting my stuff mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. you start seeing mimic um i don't know like walmart versions of a uh, of things that I've done and things that you've done and things that other uh, people in the meat industry have done to get, uh, to somehow, how, I don't know, m- monetize, um, lesser quality of content and advice. Yeah. So I guess for those who are uninitiated, you know, Instagram kind of runs the gamut. Uh, it started, the reason it is so popular is because, in its, in its essence, it provided a core of people to show you the way that they see the world. So their photography, their images, and images are really powerful. And also, because we're lazy, images are much easier to digest than text, like blogs or MySpace or whatever. So that's why Instagram became popular. Now, what we're kind of seeing is there are certain topics you can talk about on Instagram that are really popular topics. Mm-hmm. Meat, grilling, CrossFit hunting, cupcakes and baking, all of those are a great example of like really popular topics. You mm-hmm. know, if you're a dentist, you might have a harder time engaging yeah. um, an audience. I mean, pimple popping, dude, like Dr. Pimple Popper has her show because of like YouTube and Instagram and our sick fascination with pimples. Anyway, so there's, there's some topics that just do better than others and we're lucky to, to exist in one of those. Mm-hmm. Now, now, now you have two different players, right? So then you have the amateur guys that figure out, hey, this algorithm thing, which is basically that that secret uh, calculation that no one can ever figure out um, behind the scenes, the algorithm likes when I post lots of content and high quality content, but it's nearly impossible for one person to produce that much good content. So they start reposting. And in fact, one of the biggest grilling accounts, it's a repost account, posts about, 20 photos a day, and there's no way that they're his. In fact, 95% of his feed is other people's stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But he's getting crazy popular because if you're looking for, he's basically curating a feed, right? So if you're looking for the best grilling pictures, you're going to go follow this guy because he's cherry picking from the internet. But the thing that sucks is if you're the one of the people who created this picture, you know, he's getting all the glory for something you created. The next insidious uh, like version of that is marketing companies that come in, even even like random, you know, tur- based in Turkey marketing dude who sees the algorithm and sees that grilling or meat is popular and starts a you know best butcher meat dot com whatever uh, Instagram account and just mm-hmm. like comes out the reposts and then every couple of pictures he's got a t shirt that's got a terrible meat slogan on it and his link in his bio goes to a like instant print t-shirt site. So these are, these are guys that are basically just playing the numbers to get an account, do pretty well, get you to maybe buy one of their t-shirts that they don't pay for anyway because it's print on demand. So they may or may not make money out of it, but it's not really costing them anything except effort. So that's what like repo accounts have become or I know I'm rambling, but it's crazy. So, or people will repost, 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 repost till they get like 10,000 followers and then change their account to being a name so they look like someone who has influence. Okay. Because they know the actual act of reposting will help them grow. And in some cases, they even change industries altogether. So they'll pick one of those aforementioned like popular topics and just hammer it and then change and be like, insurance buying but have 10,000 followers it's crazy yeah that is yeah on, on really? twitter they made it so you couldn't change your name more than more than uh twice yeah but that's cuz twitter is not owned by facebook right yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> also the app we're using to communicate <laughs> the irony i know but good thing we're both recording it i mean you know the podcast and facebook um, right. And so, uh, two years, I, I was looking at, uh, you know, what happened 
what was going on last time we were on the show in July uh, 25th, 2017. So oh two, my God. So two and a half years. You, your book wasn't out yet. It was, I think, in uh, Australia, and you were doing pre-orders. Yeah. So, yeah. and you had, I think, only hardcore carnival, uh, carnival, carnivore, black and red at the time. What had? Mm-hmm. So let let's. Um, it, what compliments? What what do you want to do first? Do you want to do the the rubs and then go to the book, or start with the book? And and I'm sure they're very entwined. So. Dude, I can't even believe, like, the book feels so old to me. It's crazy that it was just, like, a year and a half ago that it came out in the States. But the book was originally published in Australia, and it came out in the States, I guess, in, in the summer or spring of 2018, mm-hmm. which is crazy. To me. Uh, and it's called Hardcore Carnivore, and the U.S. edition has a forward by Tuffy Stone, who's a very prominent barbecuer. And um, since then, so Hardcore Carnivore has grown. We have five seasonings in the line now. We have our own uh, bespoke, like, food-safe printed butcher's paper, which probably is, like, what the hell to all your listeners, but the barbecue <laughs> world, that, that unlined, um, unbleached butcher's paper is super, super popular for grilling and barbecue. Mm-hmm. We have a pit logbook. We have high-heat grilling gloves. Um, we're sold in multiple continents around the globe. So it's gone from a little bit of a passion project to a full-blown business, which is pretty neat. Congratulations. Um, thank you. <laughs> I mean, but you know what, Travis? It's hard work, mate. Like, just like you. Like, I see you doing your Patreon. I think that's how you say it, right? Uh, yes. We're going to go with that. Okay. Patreon. So I see you doing that. I see you creating content. I see you creating, like, informational and educational content. And, you know, it's that's all effort. So for me and hardcore carnivore, I worked my, I worked my ass off and, you know, I, I continue to be hungry for success and information and education and knowledge and just keep grinding. Yeah. It, um, so, so what, what are the, uh, the five seasons seasonings you have now? And then what, what complements or, or what does each seasoning help complement? I guess. And yeah. So before I forget, okay. The seasonings were used in the last World Butchers Challenge. Team USA and Team New Zealand used the seasonings in their presentation. No. But Team Australia, where I'm originally from, did not. So Luke Layson, when you listen to this, you better get your ass into gear for 2020 Sacramento. Because I know Team USA is already sponsored by Hardcore Carnivore, go team. Mm-hmm. But um, so uh, that's the thing. I just feel this like this camaraderie with with the butcher world. So anyway, uh, our first season that we brought out was black, and that uh, has activated charcoal in it, which you've probably seen ripped off by everyone and their mother. <laughs> but we were we were the ones who made it popular, <laughs> and uh, it's really simple so my ethos is coming back to the meat i think a lot of seasonings have uh, a lot of different flavors in them you know and and something like for example msg which okay it's a natural product and it's not as bad as everyone thinks and that's fine but it is a very overpowering flavor Mm -hmm. and i would argue that it's very difficult to taste the natural nuances of the flavor of the meat you're cooking if there's msg present so all of our rubs don't have msg and the idea is that they're designed to enhance without overpowering the meat. So black is the first one, and that's for red meat, mainly because of that color difference. But all of the all of the flavor profiles are simple. Um, you know, classic garlic, onion powder, very, very, very light chili that you probably won't even taste just just for a little bit of, um, you know, a little level there um, to balance it out. The next one we brought out was red, which is for pork and chicken. Um, Same flavor as black, just a different profile. The third one we brought out, sorry, different color. The third one we brought out was called Amplify, and it was made with chicken fat powder, and it took me ages to track that down (laughs) because instead of finding a chicken base, you know, that was like chicken flavored, whatever, and maltodextrin, I actually tracked down a true, like, three-ingredient 
chicken stock freeze dried, chicken fat freeze dried, and rosemary just for preservative purposes, which you can't even taste. Mm -hmm. And so then we add things in like yeast concentrates and soy, all those umami flavors to just make it like an all natural umami bomb. So I put that on veggies a lot because the best way to eat vegetables is by putting chicken fat powder on them, let's be honest. (laughs) Yeah. And then we came out with camo and that's a real fragrant, interesting one um, because I designed it for game and therefore also lamb because they have kind of more ballsy, gamey flavor to them. They can take a much more aromatic spice and, and still feel a bit more balanced. Mm-hmm. And then the last one we put out was in, in conjunction with Lone Star Beer, which is a huge iconic brand here in Texas. And it's a chili lime. So... Uh, you know, I've been known to rim a margarita glass with it and also use it, you know, for fajitas or uh, on ground beef for picadillo or for taco seasoning. And it's, it's pretty good stuff. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like it. Um, so what? I uh, not What was that? Have I not sent it to you yet? I have. Uh... I feel so horrible I, now. Ah, that is fine. I have at least five of them, or four of them, and I okay. and I have a big container, like milk jug size jar of the the black. Okay. And uh, I feel better now. But okay. We'll we'll fix that. Okay. And then, um, so so your your book, uh, what ex, um, and what. As, uh, people often ask me to write a book, and I'm dyslexic. It sounds horrible. Um, what is <laughs> what is what was motivated you to do it, and what were I think just what are the steps to writing a book, let alone doing all the research and the finding the recipes and like where where did you begin once you you committed to it? We can we can all the way cuss, right? Yeah. Oh, it's fucking horrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's. It's okay. So first you negotiate your book deal and book contracts are unlike any other contracts on the planet. Mm -hmm. So you already feel like, Oh my God, what just happened when that part gets done? Yeah. Then they go, "Uh, now here's a really small time to write the book because we have to have it out and they plan it. Like you want it out for father's day or grilling season or Christmas season. But it takes like six to eight months just to actually print and ship. So you're working like two years in advance, but your actual time to write the book and hand in the first manuscript is real short, usually. Unless you're super famous and you can negotiate all the time in the world for yourself, in which case, good luck. In which case, also, if you're listening to this, you should subscribe to Travis's portrayal. (laughs) But uh, uh, then you go through a stage. So I, you know, I... I publish a recipe every week on my website, jessprials.com. And I'm completely in control of the media on my site, on Hardcore Carnivore, on my social channels, on my, my videos. And for the first time ever, you've got someone editing you, mm-hmm. right? So you've got someone coming back to you with stuff like, a publisher told me that they get the most ridiculous questions once the book is published. So things like ingredient list, one pork loin, one cup of water, one garlic clove. And I get the manuscript back and there's a little mark next to garlic clove and it says, do you mean peeled? Question mark. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I did. And they're like, well, you actually have to say it because otherwise we get people that don't know to peel a garlic clove and they write in complaining that the recipe was like super papery. So for the first time, you got someone editing your stuff and commenting on your stuff. And, and when you're a bit of a like control freak boss person, like I am, mm-hmm. it's probably, um, getting the final book was incredibly rewarding. But I guess if anyone is thinking about it, just be cautious because there are nice books. And I was lucky enough to, to sign with a big publisher and end up with a really nice book. And then there's like books that, you know, you might not be so proud of in a couple of years. And there were already things that I would change about this book, like a couple of recipes that I wish I'd snuck in. Uh, for the most part, I'm super proud of it. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. I'm, I, I think it is evergreen. It, it's basically the one thing that confused people was 
You know, I market myself as a meat cook. So whether that's grilling, smoking, barbecue, oven, pan sear, whatever, it's about the meat, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, people bought the book. There's two different people. One, Some people bought it assuming it was a barbecue book, even though it doesn't say that anywhere on it. And they're pissed that there weren't like all barbecue recipes. Yeah. But I don't think it should be about that. It should be in cooking the meat the best way that that piece of meat should be cooked, not mm -hmm. put everything in the smoker. And then a few people bought it because they thought it was, I guess, the carnivore diet, <laughs> and it's not. <laughs> so that was pretty funny, too. But, okay. Yeah. Well, I think uh, I own a copy, and aesthetically, it is a visually just a, a good quality, beautiful book. And and there's a lot of great stuff in there. Um, what would you say without, because you, one, we want people to pick it up and we don't want to, but what are your, uh, I guess, two standalone, uh, standalone uh, recipes or methods that you are really proud of that came as a result of the book? Oh my God. That's such a hard question. It's like picking your favorite child. It's easy. Seriously. I have one kid, so I would, Oh, well, good for you. <laughs> and I have two there, dogs, and I would easily pick Max over Milo. So <laughs> That's so harsh. I know. Um, okay, there's a recipe for crispy pork belly in there um, that I adore because the crackling works every time, and other people are like, oh, my God, I did it. Because crackling is like this enigma, right? Mm -hmm. How to actually... Um, also... Is. Yeah, it's true. So, so, um, so what's the, well, I guess it's in the book. Continue. <laughs> it is, but I also, you know what? It's really hard. So this is the one thing. So if anyone hasn't figured it out yet, based on my like completely ridiculous accent, I grew up in Australia, but live in the States now. And, it, and I find it really difficult to find skin on pork here. Mm -hmm. um, probably the Asian markets near me carry it. And then if you've had back sealed pork or frozen pork, you're pushing shit uphill trying to get skin to crackle because of that moisture that's basically been, you know, forced in there. In Australia, I guess it's just much more common to, to, to ask for skin on pork. And I'm going to ask you this question. Mm -hmm. So why in your travels and in your experience, have you, do you see that people are asking or, or the consumer or, whatever you're giving them is mainly skin off? And if so, why? Um, why do you think Americans don't like pork skin? So, I I don't know. <laughs> I, I, it's, uh, I would say that skin on um, or skin usually ends up more in a byproduct sense is, is rendering than it does in the food or, or in the finished product. Uh, I've worked at retail shops that try to use every bit of skin and try to have every cut in the case have the rind on um you know it, you could smoke your bacon with the skin on and then make it easy to peel and then use that as a flavor enhancer for like um you know beans or something like that the piece of the skin mm -hmm. um where i currently work we receive you know uh you know 40 40 pigs uh, that we could process in a day and two of them will maybe have the skin on and the rest will be skinned out at our requests at the slaughterhouse because we don't have a market to, to fill. Um, but do you know what? What? As I asked you that question, I had this like major light bulb go off over my head mm -hmm. where I realized like how much of a fan I am of pork rinds when I stop at a gas station. Yeah. And therefore, the market in the United States are pork rinds, which is not a market that exists in Australia. It's just not really a common snack there. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, because at the end of the day, your industry is all about value adding and yeah. who's going to pay the most per pound, which is why our side of things in the barbecue world is seeing meatier uh, baby backs than ever because y'all are leaving some of the loin on there because mm -hmm. um, the price of baby backs exceeded the price of, you know, pork loin. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm wondering if it's just that they can, you can get more dollar per pound selling it to the, the pork rind makers. Um, you, 
I don't know. I know like we, we, it's cheaper for us to, when we make sausage, because we make an Italian sausage that has pork skin in it, it's cheaper for us to just buy it by the case than it is to have all of our pigs be skin on. Um, okay. And then the skinning process from the slaughterhouse, they're also a, a packing facility, but they, they probably pull, I think they, um, they, they pull it on the hide. Now that, that hair mm. and all that go, if people really want to be grossed out, they could listen to our rendering episode, but pork hair is often from the scalder, uh, stripped and denuded of its chemical proteins to abstract the spongy like protein that is mostly found in like spongy like bread. And they use it <laughs> um, for, for that. People don't really know that. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think but hang on. Are you telling me that? See, I thought that mostly butchers listen to this. Yeah, but like uh, a lot, a lot of our listeners are butchers, but a lot of them are not a lot of like I don't. Many of them don't like uh, know the rendering side of the industry that I've I've I had. Can to, say, I can see that. I yeah. can see that. I I'm probably an anomaly in that I've been to many many different slaughterhouses and processing facilities in Australia and the U.S. Mm-hmm. and. But that's because, like, I made it my business to annoy people until they let me go there. Yeah. But I can see that you could get a job at, like, Whole Foods or whatever and become a butcher and do, do training and never hit that side of it. So, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And, and um, but what with, with pork skin, I think, yeah. Uh, when I worked on the, the East Coast, we had a huge, uh, I want to talk more about you in a second, but I'll just, uh, we, uh, we were cutting for a large uh, grocery store, let's call it uh, Together Foods, and we were cutting like 80 pigs uh, a week for them. And mm-hmm. they would, the the hams would be skinned, the picnic would be skin, skinned, mm-hmm. the butt would have the skin on, and then the loin would have the skin on. And all that extra skin went in a rendering barrel that we sold to crab fishermen. Hmm. Or lobster. What fishermen. about the belly? The belly, uh, we would skin as well. I became very good at skinning I would, bellies. I mean, I just can't imagine like a pork roast, like a pork cheddar without. And, and so here's the other thing that like shits me from my point of view, right? When you're on the cooking side and you're trying to tell people about cooking. Mm hmm. My whole story, like the super Cliff Notes version, is that I didn't really know how to cook meat. I was intimidated by it, didn't know which cuts to buy, and you know, like a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> through a trip to Texas, fell in love with barbecue, inadvertently learned a lot about beef and therefore other meat. Here I am today. And part of that is when you often read pork recipes and porchetta recipes, they often don't say like, it's really hard when you don't know what you're looking for. And maybe this will help some butchers, you know, who are at the counter talking to their customers or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like it's really hard to know that you're supposed to ask for skin or that there's supposed to be skin on there. You mm-hmm. just go, okay, I'm going to go buy a pork belly and it should crackle. And why doesn't it look like this beautiful golden crispy thing in the picture? Why hasn't my fat rendered? Because you don't have skin on it. You know, like, mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of recipes out there in the cooking side of things that don't address that anomaly uh, that happens in butcher land sometimes. Yeah. And I, and I always, if, um, <coughs> I always say to people that a good butcher should understand, like, if a customer asks something for a specific recipe, you know, like, I'm looking for this and it's like, oh, what's the recipe? What's, and, they should be able to sell the appropriate roast or the appropriate cut. Um, and also give cooking advice as well. I think a well-rounded yeah, but you know, on, on that note, I'm sorry, but I have to tell you, this happens, especially in Australia. Mm-hmm. So not necessarily the butchers, but most of the, most of the actual ranchers in Australia, like prefer their meat to the medium to well side. Ew. Like the old, the old guys, which is really weird. Uh-huh. But, um, 
I do this thing in my classes, right, where I encourage people, obviously, to go in and talk to their butcher. But we hear horror stories like, I mean, horror stories might be overstating it. But <laughs> like, oh, I tried to get a tri-tip and they sold me a picanha. Yeah. You know, I didn't even know it was that until later when I knew. Mm-hmm. And I equate it like this. If you went to school or to technical college 40 years ago to become an electrician, then you know, you don't know anything about smart lighting unless you've kept up on it. Mm-hmm. So unless you've gone to conferences and like educational workshops and stuff to understand what like all of this smart lighting and Alexa stuff and whatever is, you're going to know what the lighting industry was like 40 years ago. And I feel like there were a lot of butchers that trained back then when tricep was not a word that you uttered outside of California. Yeah. You know, so I always try and explain to people, like, it's not that the butcher is trying to pull one over on you to just, you know, sell what they have in the case or give you whatever to get you out of the store. It's often that these guys just don't know any better. Um, and I try and re-educate people. Well, I try to educate people about how cuts change. Someone tagged me the other day, Travis, and they go, oh, have you ever tried a Baja filet? Have you? No. I don't know. Do you know what it is? No, I don't. Okay, yeah. I was like, no. And I knew exactly. I knew when they posted it. I'm like, some motherfucker has gone out and renamed a cut. Mm -hmm. Just like Strip, New York Strip, Kansas City Strip, which in Australia is a porterhouse or a sirloin. And I had a massive online like argument with my Australian fans when I told them that top sirloin was rump in Australia, which it is. Mm-hmm. And they're like, no, it's not sirloin, it's porterhouse. I'm like, no, it's not. Sirloin's a street. Anyway, it was the whole thing. And I'm like, please. It's because it's at the top of the sirloin. But... <laughs> no, because a sirloin in Australia is a strip. Yeah, th- but, but see the so a sirloin is the is in Australia would be the strip, but the top of the sirloin, which is above the strip, see it's at the top. So both people yeah. could be right. But top sir, but top butt in Australia is the rump. So for example, rump cap, aka picanha. Sorry, top sirloin cap, which mm-hmm. is picanha, is called rump cap in Australia because that whole like top butt is called. Baja Filet, I googled it after the fact, and it turns out it's Terrace Major. And I'm like, you bastards! Like, really? Like, and someone's like, have you ever tried this? And like, it's in my cookbook. Yeah. Yes, I've tried it. <laughs> uh, and Terrace is one that I wish so many more people had access to because I love to share it and talk about it. Mm-hmm. But it's really hard to talk about cuts that people just can't find. Like even. Even navel, like uh, there's a recipe on my YouTube for beef bacon and Mm -hmm. people are constantly like, I can't get it. I can't get it. I'm lucky because I have access to like, you know, I have access to wholesale uh, meat. So I can't, I can order uh, non-retail cuts, but it's kind of, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. I don't know where you would be able to get navel. I wholesale name yeah, to a bunch of people. Navel, if any of those box beef companies were smart, they'd start selling it. Yeah. And if they do, then they listen to this podcast. <laughs> you could DM me. My company sells it and ships. So, do they really? Yeah. I literally get asked all the time. I will. I will. Yeah. You. You got to give me the info because. Yeah. There's one. There's an email sitting in my inbox right now. Oh, okay. Nice. Um. Yeah. The. Uh, Terrace, Terrace Major is good. We used to call it uh, petite tenders, shoulder tenders, all those different things. Yeah, petite filet. It's, yeah. it's just so fun to cook. It reminds me of like a tiny little venison uh, backstrap. Mm-hmm. Like just it's, I, you know, obviously from a cook's perspective, anything that's cylindrical shape is just so beautiful to cook up. Mm-hmm. And you get those gorgeous medallions on the plate and it's lovely and tender. And someone did a, you know, I don't know if, you know this side of things, but there's this Warner Bratzler shear force machine. So there's a machine that measures tenderness in meat mm-hmm. uh, by resistance, basically. And uh, there's a couple that, like, tenderloin that takes the number one spot, unarguably, and there's an argument for what takes the second spot, and it's usually an argument between flat iron and terrace major. Mm-hmm. Depending on which, uh, which journal you're reading. I like 
the Terrace Major more um, than pretty much any other cut. It, it's easy when I when I was working in a uh, doing like mass production breaking. Uh, like we we would have all these uh, old coal cows that we would mm-hmm. be boning out, and at the end of the shift, uh, everyone's lunch would be a few terrace majors that they put in their butcher pockets during the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then we would put them in vacuum bags and then uh, sous vide them in our hot knife dips. <laughs> but you know. Like part of that issue as well is I get people like I talk about the terrace and then people try and go find it and then someone will give them a mock tender and obviously yeah. they're going to have a shitty experience, eating experience in comparison. Yeah. You know? One so of the this is, cuts. Like, yeah. And you know, and, and so this is why I can sit here and talk to you about this stuff, which, you know, I'm going to toot my own horn because I'm just not going to be afraid of it. But I don't think that there's that many people on the cooking side that could talk to you about it. No, like no, it, and, it, there's not. I, but like the point, you know, the point is that, you you know, it's my responsibility to need to know this stuff because I need to be able to speak to it, to these people who are asking about it and also be like, what the hell, you know, I want to know what I'm eating. I, I'm still learning for sure. Like the hindquarter is still a little bit of an enigma to me, but um, I, I love being able to uh, tell you all of that knowledge, knowledge when I break down D or two, that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Although it's tiny, like the terrorist major on a tiny little white tail doe is tiny. Yeah, no, for fun. Uh, I, I, if I'm doing demos, which not that often actually, um, I'll find all the tiny esoteric cuts that are marketable on beef. If I'm doing like a lamb and show people, I'll even seem out a lamb flat iron, flat iron. That's awesome. Um, so uh, tell me about these uh, these uh, beef seminars and uh, demonstrations you're doing. Who who are those geared to, and what's the the correct name? And and yeah, yeah, I, I do like I I change the name all the time. Sometimes it's beef workshop, sometimes it's beef masterclass. I just love beef is my favorite protein. It's the one that I know the most about. It's the one that I understand the most about in terms of uh, the cuts and. It's the one that I love to eat the most. So I definitely favor it. I do a lot of work with Texas Beef Council, who are awesome. Um, and I do these master classes kind of usually once or twice a year. And it's so hard in the environment that I'm in because so many people are just doing like, come and watch my brisket class. And I just, <laughs> I hate doing what everyone else is doing. It just, it gives me hives, you know? Mm-hmm. I like to really be individual and offer people something different. So in these classes, like I've got a USD, a set of USDA grading cards and I run through grading and I open a vac seal with them and I show them like, this is the, uh, this is the plant number. You can see it on every pack. And I talk to them about traceability and, you know, not to be scared of, of grain fed and, and, and that they can make the choice. But my big thing this is, I know I'm segueing, but I feel like you're the man to talk to this about. <laughs> I've had a lot of discussions lately. Anyway, hang on. Oh. So if you want to come to my big class, justpriles.com, check it out. It's lots of fun. We break things down but, <laughs> and cook them. But um, I feel like there's a lot of box beef companies in particular mm-hmm. that are creating fear to sell their product. So suggesting that somehow theirs is healthier, cleaner, safer, better than the counterparts at, you know, Swift, JBS, Taze, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, And in this environment of impossible meat and veganism, Mm -hmm. I feel like anyone who is a carnivore needs to stick together. And there's a way that people who believe in grass finishing can promote their product without it being at the expense of shitting on the grain industry. And there's a way the grain industry can continue to do what they do without bad talking quality of grass fed beef. Because mm-hmm. carnivores need to stick together. That's what I think right now. Yeah. Um, I'm really, man, you know what? I need to not have red wine before we talk. Uh, Cause it's this fine. is, the, the, this is what, well, I think that it's so like, 
uh, grass fed is like three, like honestly, it's like maybe seven percent of the market out there. Um, oh, you mean the U.S. market or the import stuff? I'm ta- I'm talking about U.S. market. Um, mm-hmm. so, so it's, it's not that much. And I think that it's like with any, um, small market that it's the one that people actually pay the most attention to because they're the loudest and they're the loudest right. at, at advertising. It's like, mm-hmm. um, like veganism, only 3% of the population identifies as vegan, but you see them online. You think everyone's vegan. Um, right. Because it is their advertising. And I think that just the nature of the game is with the only thing that's being regulated as far as labeling claims on pastured, um, organic, um, grass fed, grass finished is the with those regulations, people are always going to, you know, let's say that the. the pr- everything switches over to grass fed or everything is corn fed. People are still going to find more buzzwords to um, push them above uh, a- another product, regardless of quality or not. It's like Hoofords used to be the number one beef in America until the eighties. And then the uh, Angus campaign came out and then yeah. it ne- necessarily didn't make uh Angus beef better or hoofer beef worse. It was just a better advertising campaign. But you know what's funny? I've spoken to the professors at AM about this. And and so on 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 basic terms, yes, I agree. It's a marketing thing. And that's why when I see like billboards that say like 100 percent Angus grind and now burgers, and I'm like, that's awesome. Is it cutter canner Angus? Like yeah. that doesn't mean anything. It's not certified. It's not you know, great, graded, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but the professor at the AM did tell me that in their experience, and they do have that experience, that even though they're both pretty free, the anger has just slightly more propensity to marvel. Mm-hmm. In Australia, we're is then kind of anger terms and split, um, especially farms like, um, uh, or brands like Cape Broom, I know, have both. As long as it's British free, they're happy. But they seem to suggest that that was the case, that, that there was actually that slight difference in terms of genetics. Mm-hmm. Dude, did you see that clone steak? No. That sounds weird. What, so West Texas A&M, West Texas A&M University in Canyon, there's nothing there except mm-hmm. for this university in a giant canyon called Palo Duro, second biggest after the Grand Canyon. Mm-hmm. Uh, they cloned a bull that was like two or three days dead in the chilla that was yield grade one, USDA prime, and they decided to clone him. They sent me a steak. They cloned him. They cloned females. So it was alpha was the clone bull. Gamma was the clone cow or heifer. And then they bred them. Uh-huh. And they sent me a stake of the progeny. So now, like, Alpha's long gone, but they're doing all of these experiments basically just to sell the genetics. It's, like, wild. So, and the progeny are, not, are only yield grade two, so it's kind of wild that both parents are yield grade one, but the genetics is still only yielding uh, the second grade, the grade down. I'm just imagining this dystopian-like future where... Yeah. Every ribeye you ever get, if you're wherever you are in the world, is the same quality because it's from the same animal. How do you feel about that? Um, I think people need to have bad meals every once in a while. Um, Good way of putting it. And uh, having variety, I think. Ver- uh, I think variety in uh, from a capitalism standpoint makes for a better marketplace. Um, they said. Uh, so as far as they, so FDA has approved clone meat for sale, but you'll never actually likely see clone meat for sale because it's just too expensive. Oh. And they're really just using it for genetics and AI. Yeah. Which I hope everyone knows does not mean artificial intelligence in this industry. What does it mean? Artificial insemination of the animal. Oh, I walked right into that, Jess. Ah. Um. 
Good times. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, it, it's talking about like quality and stuff like that. It's like people who buy organic hamburger, like organic uh, hamburger is mostly made from coal, coal of uh, organic dairy cows because people like right. organic milk. And when the feed to producing ratio plateaus around like nine or so years or, you know, after they've been bred three times and they're no longer producing and mastitis and they're, you know, pretty much uh, minus level grading, then they just they don't even get graded and they just get turned into ground meat. I tell you this. Hang on. You just open Pandora's box, right? Because. <laughs> yeah. From a meat science perspective, Herefords actually marble as one of the best breeds. Mm-hmm. That's not her. Sorry. Um, Holsteins. God, I just totally forgot. Holsteins. I was like, the Chick fil A cow, come on. Yeah. Holsteins marble uh, incredibly, but the eye is really small, so they don't get the yield grades. But mm-hmm. it's not unusual to find dairy cow marble really well. But then you've got this whole thing like Steak Revolution. And there were programs suddenly in Australia for like vintage beef all over Sweden and, and Scandinavia. You're seeing like old retired cows, the Rubia Gallegas in, in Spain. And it's like all the rage, so hot right now, hand soul kind of shit, right? Mm-hmm. The problem that no one talks about is that what exactly what you're saying. Most of this, these animals will still end up in hamburger because even though we the, the general consensus has been that if an animal gets over like 24 months, it's basically trash, right? That's what our industry used to think. Yeah. And then, and then oh, like dark cutter, tough, forget about it. Yeah, and then, and then that- you could get these extraordinary, like if you let the dairy cow go or you let, you know, these certain breeds go. They were still at the, the eating quality and palatability of a nine year old, 15 year old animal, whatever, was on par to a prime Angus, like 18 month old animal, steer. And everyone is talking about that stuff now and it's all the rage. But what they don't talk about is the percentages. Mm-hmm. So, yes, it's possible that instead of just discounting all of these senior animals there as trash, there are a percentage that are as good eating. I wouldn't say necessarily better because I've had 15 year old, uh, Charolais in Sweden before. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't say it was better. It was just different, but their the quality of their grass feed is also different. But, um, no one talks about that. It's like this micro percent. Like it's gotta be, it's certainly under 10 I think it's got to be under five, just like prime carcasses mm. of, of the older cattle that actually grade into this kind of delicacy factor. Yeah. Have, have you seen much of this on your side of things? Um, not, not so much now. Uh, you know, I know uh, I used to work for a, a farm that would have, that, that was an Angus farm. And for them to be 100% grass fed, they'd have to take their animals to over 30 months of age. Um, and, but that, that made beautiful quality and also made a very expensive animal because your feed to life ratio is now plateauing out. Um, and then when I worked in Vermont, we, it was a, it was like a cut and wrap for small local farms. So every animal we got was, could be from a different farm. And Mm -hmm. I would see like, uh, 15 year old Highlanders that would have like some of the best marbling ever. And they were just wild. And the farmer was like, yeah, I put an ear tag on them and let them loose on the property and rounded them up first, first thing this morning. Mm. And, um, then, but any most animals that I've ever that were actually milking animals are gen, mm. are genuinely I see them later stage in life. It's that have given birth, be it Jerseys or Holsteins, um, and they are uh, their live grading were minus two to minus threes. Um, mm. Every once in a while, we'd get one that was zero, uh, 
these are live grading uh, specs that I don't. Right. Um, and then we, um, but those all went besides the rounds went to burger, and then the rounds would go to jerky. Uh, right. Most jerky people eat is uh, that too. Um, but we would get, uh, you know, Angus that would be uh, cows who have given birth, and they they would have pretty good marbling, you know. And, and hey, be- I have a question for you. This totally, I'm gonna just do it. Yeah. How would you feel if someone said, "I'm gonna start a company making jerky out of tenderloin"? Um, one. It so I've been approached by this more or less before, and I know there's a com- couple companies that do it. Uh, jerky alone is expensive because your yield is so low from your raw material to your finished material and the time and labor you put into it, um, mm-hmm. and then the smoking of it. And tenderloin, you're either gonna have to cut it thick to thicker to make it stay together. Um, and I don't know. It's just like you could just mechanically tenderize any, uh, piece of round meat and have the same result. But if people want to advertise it as tenderloin jerky, I think that's what people want to do. But also the nature of jerky is not to be necessarily tender. So this is the crazy thing. I'm asking because it exists. I saw it on Shark Tank a while ago, and I like lost my mind and tweeted in general. Yeah. I guess, and the company that well, in question now that the guys were like basically based in New York, and they're like, oh, because New Yorkers need tenderloin jerky, you know. And I'm like, everything that you said, but then I got super passionate and pissy about the fact that there's so many cuts on an animal that can be used for secondary purposes like that the yeah. fact that you need a tenderloin to do that just drives me crazy yeah so well just i was tiptoeing with my answer because i didn't i was like just can't possibly want to make think this is a good I know, idea I just like, you like that yeah <laughs> no but it's absolutely stupid um when i was working in la this chocolate company approached me because they wanted to do take tenderloin run it dry it run it through a bowl chopper and have dried beef that they would uh dip in chocolate i mean that sounds gross yeah straight up yeah and 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 they told me this with enthusiasm and the position i was in at the company i smiled and looked at them and it's like yeah take your money i just I just, I mean, I get it. If they're willing to buy it, sure. Mm-hmm. But I, I can't. They're so, I can't. I can't. It's just ridiculous. People yeah. need to be more responsible. That's more responsible. Yeah. Well, My version of people use the meat properly. Yeah, and I think it's... Um... Another thing with tenderloin, if they're buying it for that purpose, they're not buying the best tenderloin. I mean, but it's like, it's anything. It's like those gold, gold leaf burgers or whatever, right? Oh, I hate that stuff. Dude, I can't, we haven't even touched the surface. I hate the the 15 patty burgers and just like shit that Instagram turns viral just because it's like stuff that no one would eat in real life. It's gratuitous use of food. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's so bad. Give me a break. Yeah. It's like, oh, you're putting flavorless, odorless gold that came from a probably shitty scenario for someone in a third world country for you right. to eat it and make it into shit two days later. Some people just have too much money. A fool and his money are pretty potted. Isn't that what they say? Yeah. And yeah. I don't know. I just don't get the glorification of just like, unne- like if if the if it's good, then why do you gotta mm-hmm. why do you gotta make it? I think it honestly, it's appealing to the lowest common denominator. It's like appealing to people like, man, I wish I could eat that, or like that looks it's pretty cool. Shirts, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Sorry if anyone's wearing an affliction shirt, but you should probably be more self aware. <laughs> yeah. They also wear Ed, hey, Ed hey, Hardy. This conversation was going to go this way when it started. No. I just wish I was drinking, but I had. I, mean, I know you promised me the whole point of this was that you were supposed to be drinking martinis. I know. And we were supposed to do a alcohol influenced podcast. Well, and we frankly, could st- I'm offended. Well, Jess, I wasn't trying to offend you. I, <laughs> I, I, I usually do my drinking after my son's in bed because I hide my alcoholism <laughs> like my shame. Um, so next time, let's do it. Like I know it'll be super late here in Texas, but let's just do that and see what happens. Or I can wake up super early, and it's not that I. I and I'm joking. I don't. Morning. What? You want to drink in the morning? I live on the beach, Jess. I could do whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> um, no but and i'm also not trying to hide it from my son um it's just if he's he's around he's gonna want to drink too and he doesn't shut up because he's yeah. uh, four Chatter. so he's chatty chatty kathy yeah and he wants his red wine and then everyone will realize how bad of a parent i am <laughs> he's very greek so <laughs> Actually, we we give him like he has his own wine glass, and we give him like uh, cranberry juice in it, and he cheers as everybody. Oh, that's that's pretty cute. Yeah, and then yeah, we took him to a winery once, and like he was doing that, and it's like it's cute, and like I was like, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Super. Um. I'll send you a picture of him doing that. It's funny. Um, <laughs> no, but I, I think we should. Or uh, I, I need to get out there. I do. Because I, I love what y'all do for us. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't think that you get enough credit for what you do. And I think you should be way more celebrated. It's kind of happening. There's kind of more shows and more opportunities, but it should be way more than it is even now. Yeah, i I think it. I think it's coming through. I just don't want the wrong people to be highlighted. Yeah, um, but let me tell you something. Yes. All I'll say is this: mm-hmm. there are people who make make it on either food network shows as contestants as judges or whatever, because media loves a little package, right? So they love to be able to say award-winning pit master. So you might've won a competition once with 20 people out in rural Idaho, mm-hmm. but you're typically still award-winning and that's a nice little package for media, right? Yeah. So, I agree with you. Like, it would be nice if the right people got on camera, but if the right people aren't good on camera, it's just not going to happen. So just, if you're out there and you're an amazing butcher and you're lamenting why people aren't following you, just keep grinding. Yeah. But, eventually. but I'll also say this and the other effect, that a lot yeah. of the, it sucks, but like some of the negative feedback I I get is butchers that are, trolls who more or less had this like well why is no one looking at the stuff i do when they have no presence and they're not personable well i mean just because you think you're great doesn't mean everyone else will too that's also a consideration yeah um and i think that you know i think that it is in some ways a cool industry to be in that there's veterans like you who have seen a lot of shit come and go and you know a lot and then, you know, there are programs now when you could where you do a three month butchery uh, internship and, and come out the other end and some hipster in some city who wants to start a butcher shop is gonna hire you. Do yeah. they know as much as you and Brian? Absolutely fucking not. You've you've caught a tremendous amount of experience under your belt. But they probably want the notoriety and the infamy, you know? Yeah. Or uh, or they go through that program and then they they're a chef and they want to add something else to the resume is, is one thing I've had the problem with is hiring someone, training them not to a good point, but to a point where they felt they were 
they were confident and then they left to oh, there's a chick on social who did like a two-day camp that someone else organized mm-hmm. who then added like butcher to her bio and i'm like uh no that's not like i would never call myself a butcher i know a lot about butchery i do a breakdown of a top butt in some of my classes i can cut you know a, a top leg roast into a, a flat iron which is really fucking hard mm. um i'm <laughs> for me at least <laughs> um but I would never, ever call myself a butcher. I know some butchery, but I would never do it. And I think that's the thing that, oh, but you know, that people see it on the other side. Like there are people who come to Texas and, and stage, which is the culinary term for basically working for free in someone else's kitchen mm-hmm. for two weeks at, at any barbecue joy in Austin and suddenly they're a pit master. Yeah. Is it basically in your industry? Yeah, no, we definitely have the fr- uh, a bunch of stages. We c- we call it the French word for slavery. Um, <laughs> and it, when I worked in LA, is is prevalent. Uh, but one of the best butchers that I know, who ended up opening up the Maple Block Barbecue Place in LA, this guy named um, Adam Cole, was a stage in learning how to break beef, learning how to. And every single day, uh, he was a, a server at night at a restaurant. He would come to the butcher shop and he did that for a, a couple years and actually got a free career out of it. Yeah. So, well, so it, it does work sometimes, but that's the only time yeah, I've that's, ever. That's also, that's also a really unusual story of someone who was exceptionally dedicated. Don't yeah. You think? Oh yeah. And he was also very smart because the second like, Oh, this guy's always here. And like someone called in sick and the owner is like, well, you're, Oh, don't worry. Adam will be here. And that's the second he asked for money. Right. <laughs> yeah. Cause right. now he has value. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. and yeah, I've also had like, I think the worst is like, I was doing this, uh, I used to, get paid to break down carcasses for restaurants and the chef's like i would do it you know but i just don't have the time and then proceeded to watch me the entire time yeah that pretty much suggests that you do have the time and what you're lacking is the knowledge maybe the thing is i don't understand why this is shame just because you've got knuckle tattoos and neck tattoos and you're this great chef like it's cool if you don't know how to butcher yeah it's cool to acknowledge that you work with a great butcher like, that's okay, you know? I rely on my butchers. Mm-hmm. Well, I I stand by this, and it's controversial, but all chefs want to be butchers, but no butchers want to be chefs because we're already I, awesome. Uh, <laughs> I just I, added in that I one, it. that last part. I get it. Um, no, I just... I don't, I, I enjoy, uh, cooking. I would never call myself a chef unless I have, I'm doing a, a barbecue, like, and I mean grilling, not like smoking. And, well, I, that's, but, that's not a barbecue. Oh, so, well, well, look, in the scenario, I have a, a Weber and I'd call myself a chef, but I was wearing an apron that said, kiss the chef. <laughs> Okay, valid. Carry yeah. on. Yeah. And I, <laughs> my terminology I know is terrible. I, I do run two or three USDA smokehouses as a, for a living. So <laughs> I shouldn't know. Well, I mean, that's, that's some form of validity too, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, we call them, I do fill out cook logs every day, but I don't feel like it's really cooking. Is it, is it all electronic? Uh, yeah, but we set up programs that do them like, so if we, you know, we, um, if we're smoking a, a ham or something, we program a pedicle stage, a smoke cycle for so many hours, our humidity levels that will be, stay at a constant. And then 
we uh then it'll hold until we get a cook and so like a ham will have one hour of pinnacle uh six hours of smoke two two hours to hit uh its cook afterwards I mean, that you know, it's not uncommon just based on, like, look at bacon, right? It's not like bacon is smoked in craft smokers. Like, mm-hmm. there are electronic smokers. The demand for the kind of product just dictates how it is sometimes. But that's also why, you know, the same as our craft butchers is room for craft barbecue, too. Yeah, definitely. And I, I just wish my work personally... Uh, got a little bit more adventurous but we also have the adage well we're selling this so we'll let's just keep doing it this way yeah don't don't if it ain't broke don't fix it right yeah and also we're we're doing like 1500 pounds at a time so (laughs) yeah i mean sure get into that technicality sure yeah um but but i enjoy it well how many glasses have you had? How many what? Glasses of wine. How many glasses have I taught? No, I said, how many glasses of wine have you had? Oh, how many? Say, well, you'd think after that response. In fairness, it was the poor connection, not my understanding of it. <laughs> like, I would say two total. I made venison backstrap tonight, and I was like, this kind of meal deserves a glass of red. You know? Oh, nice. I mean, I hunted and butchered and cooked that thing, so I deserved a wine. Not all what today, though. Not all today, but... Because uh, that would be a busy I day. December, and I cooked it now. Okay. Also, mm-hmm. talking about uh, your life and, and, and stuff, since the last time we talked, you got married. I did. It's true. How's that? I wasn't even dating him when we talked last. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's good. Like, it's pretty It's pretty neat to find a human that you're, like, committed to hanging out with the rest of your life, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, and he eats the food I make, which is also cool. <laughs> and he, he's really tall, so he can reach things up high in, in cabinets, which is also cool. Yeah. He's a no, but I'm, I don't talk a lot about him publicly just because... Oh, I could take this out, then. No, 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 it's fine. Like I get it. I'll I mean, take it out, Jess. Nothing that I've said is like <laughs> an expose or whatever. I just, um, I, I try and not, I try and, you know, just keep some of it for me. That's all. But, um, well, it's like you and your wife. You don't talk a lot publicly about her. No. And she, I'll tell you, my wife, I, I always talk about her in anecdotic forms. Um, but, uh, I think she, she's never appeared on my Instagram unless yeah. it was a glimpse in a story. Um, there's probably a few pictures on Facebook. She doesn't even have any social media of her own. Wow. Okay. So she's a different baby. See, my husband's been in my Instagram once mm-hmm. and it was on the back and it was of our actual wedding and only because I felt like I'm not like a chronic oversharer, but I do talk a lot about my life and I feel like marriage is a pretty big deal. So like not acknowledging that that happened would be weird. Yeah. So I did one post of our wedding, like as we're getting married by, we got married by a, uh, a Texas judge of the, uh, the appeals court. And he was up there in his like 10 gallon hat and his judge robes looking Texan AF, which is <laughs> freaking so that was kind of a cool photo, but um, it was just us from the back, so you can't fully see each other. It was the most liked photo that I've ever posted on Instagram, and I'm like, you motherfucker, really? Like, <laughs> some really nice shit, some really nice meat, but you know, no one can beat a wedding dress, I guess. Everyone loves a wedding. Yeah. And, yeah, I think I post my Christmas card in a story, and then it just disappears. Um, but I'll post yeah. more about my, I'll post my son all the time, only in stories though. And your wife is cool with that? Uh, yeah. Um, no, we're not yeah. going directly against her wishes. Yeah. He, she told me she's not. And I'm like, do you know what? I got this. Um, 
And then <laughs> nah, that's not at all how a relationship works. She's very much in charge. Um, it's a pers- I'm glad you did that. That's, that's important. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, she's um, okay knowing that it's the story and that'll, you know, go away. Um, I think the thing is that, like, if a, any vegan or anything like that were to, like, you know, back in the past, I had a years ago had a photo of my nephew on there and some assholes like what if somebody karma's a bitch blah blah blah, blah. and it's like whoa god aren't they just awful yeah um like imagine, you know that saying about catching more flies with honey yeah yeah um but no i totally get the the keeping things uh personal my wife's never listened to the an episode of this podcast. I think she listened for like, uh, I really, yeah. Her her parents listen. Okay, that's that's weird. Yeah, and my mom listens, and my mom's like, you shouldn't. No, say that's it. weird. Right? That like everyone around her except she. Does she just not find you that interesting? Probably. She probably okay. judges me. That makes more sense. Yeah, I think I think she's trying to kill me, Jess. Well, I mean, this at least my- you have. A- recorded now so if it happens there's a lot of people who will yeah. present this to the police and it, it was icy the other day and she insisted i i take the the car with the bad brakes Ooh. yeah um no i think it's just because it's, 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 what something happened to travis we all know what happened yeah. I, yeah I think more that is just that uh it's awkward because i on through this podcast, I'm just more vulnerable or it's more of like a persona or whatever than in my everyday life where like in this podcast, I've talked about like everything from mental health issues to s- stuff that people, pr- I'm surprised people still listen to the show with the weird shit I've said, but like, yeah, I think it's more or less that she's like, I don't need to know everything about you. <laughs> Don't discount how much people like weirdos. It's important. Yeah. So, so you need to come to the WBC 2020. I know. I mean, what are the dates? Tell everyone what the dates are anyway. Because can general public go? People should know. Yeah, everyone can go. Uh, okay, so if you like butchery, and if you're interested in this shit, and you want to eat, you want to meet like world class people in your industry. And go to Sacramento in September on uh, September fifth, and you know we have a fifteen. I knew you were going to say that. Uh, I have... might be in London. Oh no! <laughs> anyway, we'll see. We'll see. We, we have a fifteen thousand seat venue. It's very intimate, um, and we would love to fill it. Uh, it's going to be sixteen teams of uh, the best butchers in the world and i will also be there with them and there's and like guys seriously countries that you didn't even expect Mm -hmm. for real yeah like well ireland won the ireland was the host of the last one who won the last one ireland so the i mean obviously that was rigged then well right well i can't speak on that but i'm just saying so theoretically America should win this year since it's in America. <laughs> in the in the time before it was in France and they won. Let's not talk uh, about these things. Whoa! I tell you what, though, I am sending. I am sponsoring you guys with Hardcore Carnivore. Mm-hmm. I am super like fangirl excited to be able to be a part of the team in some small little way. Mm-hmm. No, thank and you. anything that I can do to help, I will because I think. Honestly, y'all are real craftsmen and deserve all the accolades. Oh, well, thank you. And then I just want to know, we're mm-hmm. at the beginning of a year, and we'll end on this, Jess. Uh, what does... You have five rubs, a cookbook. Um, you just launched a YouTube channel, or... no, It's actually launched like two years ago, but you're updating it more now. Um, yeah, I'm actually posting to it now. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So what uh, what does 2020 have in store for you? What do you want to accomplish? And yeah. 
Okay. Um, I definitely want to grow the hardcore carnivore business. We definitely want to add more to the line. Maybe not seasoning, but we're working on a few other things. Um, definitely love to reach more people. You know, the videos you talked about YouTube is trying to, I'm filming videos like, you know, is raw meat, why is rare meat safe to eat? Is brown meat okay to eat? What do the percentages on ground beef mean? All of these questions that, you know, instead of just like, look at my juicy brisket, which would probably get me 100,000 views, I'm trying really to put something on the internet that is educational and useful and beneficial to the meat industry. Um, I've just met so many people in the industry from the people who cook it, people who cut it, people who, who raise it, and, and all the folks in between who shouldn't be discounted. Um, and they're all incredible human beings. So I'm very, very passionate about promoting anything to do with that, which comes back to that ethos of any carnivore should support all other carnivores mm-hmm. while we're under this little attack that's happening right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, just keep grinding, keep producing more videos, keep growing the business and growing the brand and, you know, keep getting to talk to cool people like you. Oh, well, That's my aim. thank you. And, uh, yeah. And, and then we'll, I said, we'll end on that, but just where could everyone find you on all the social medias? So, uh, first gratuitous, uh, self brand promotion, hardcore carnivore.com, hardcore carnivore on Instagram, and hardcore carnivore on Facebook. And then Jess Pryles, J S S P R Y L E S dot com. The same name, Jess Pryles on Instagram, Jess Pryles on Facebook, Jess Pryles on Twitter, Jess Pryles on TikTok. I've only got about three videos on TikTok and I hate it, but I'm on there. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, especially, you know love to, to hear from new people so come say hi all right awesome well thank you and no 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 thank you <laughs> oh well, i'm glad i didn't hit stop <laughs> recording yet well I'll leave that in thank you <laughs> now i did hit stop recording and jess i'm sorry i didn't have any beverages during her interview and i'll say it right now i am certainly making up for it during this editing process and I look forward to doing a live Q&A Skype response while I'm in Sacramento or Instagram response or whatever. I forget what we decided on off air and to expose the masses. And if you want to follow Jess and see the amazing things she's doing and try her amazing rubs and trust me, they are amazing. So amazing that multiple teams in the world butchers challenge has featured them in their display and i only smoke personal meats using her products because i am not creative enough to come up with my own ideas and i will rely on something that is is good and has treated me well if you're looking for ways to support the show recommend it to a friend really helps if you want to support me in doing this, check out my Patreon. Um, there's bonus content on there. I'm working on a pretty good pork shoulder up, uh, show right now. And if you want to support the American team, check out our GoFundMe. And until next time, and there will be a next time. I know they're becoming sporadic. And Keep your knife sharp and live in the margin. Postscript, if you're looking for consulting or anything, let me know. I am looking for new experiences in the realm of butchery and would love to help you out to achieve your processing and cutting goals. Thank you.